Northwest Reversible Lanes and Multimodal Safety Improvement Project Virtual Meeting Number Two. We'll be getting started in a moment. We have a full agenda this morning. Uh, our goal is to complete the overview presentation in about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll allow for approximately 15 minutes of questions. We'll then present the concept maps of the corridor. This will take about 25 minutes. Then have a session on questions and comments regarding the concept maps. The meeting agenda covers the following areas. How to participate in the virtual meeting using WebEx, the meeting objectives and project team introductions, project overview, preferred concept C, our work since January 2022, our immediate next steps, the general timeline. We'll take a pause for questions and comments on part one on the overview. We'll walk through or go through the concept maps. We'll then have a second Q&A for part two, and then we'll close the meeting. Uh, Charlotte, uh, would you like to um, uh, go over some of the slides regarding how to participate in the virtual public meeting using WebEx? Thank you, Ed, I sure will. So welcome you all again to our virtual public meeting. Um, just to begin, we will go over some basic controls with the WebEx platform. Um, please note this is an open meeting and as required by DC code 2578, this meeting is being recorded and the meeting will be made available to the public. Um, the video file will be shared on the project team's website as well as DDOT's main website. Um, it will also be uploaded to the YouTube channel um, within seven days after the meeting. This meeting is being live streamed to DDOT's Facebook page. And if you do not wish to have your voice recorded, please do not ask to speak. You may enter any questions or comments in the Q&A, which we will review shortly. If you have any technical issues during this meeting, please call 202-309-3491. Next slide. So we'll go over just some of the audio um, components of the WebEx platform. Um, currently, everyone is on mute and you cannot unmute yourself. We can unmute you during the Q&A and comment period. Um, this helps us to make sure there are no um, interruptions during the presentation. If you need to speak, um, we will ask that you use the raise hand feature. Closed caption is also enabled and available during the meeting. Click the CC icon in the lower left corner of your window. If you're using the WebEx mobile application, um, click the three dot icon, scroll down and select the closed caption option. And make sure to toggle the switch um, in blue. Um, your video camera is off by default and you will not be able to share video during the meeting. Next slide. So if you have a question or comment that you would like to speak up about, please use the raise hand feature. This indicates to the project team that you would like to speak. Um, to virtually raise your hand, click the raise hand icon on the bottom center of the WebEx window. Alternatively, you may press the control shift R key um, on your keyboard to raise your hand. And if you're using the mobile app, you can click the three dot icon and select raise hand. If you have dialed in, Please dial star three to use the raise hand function. Next slide. Um, also, we have a Q and A feature during the presentation where you can actually send a question. Um, so click the three dot icon in the bottom right side of the WebEx window and select Q and A. A new panel or window will appear in the ask field, select all panelists. Click the text box to type your question and press enter to send it. Um, if you join via the mobile app, click the Q&A or question mark icon to access the Q&A feature. Um, again, for those of you who are dialed in by phone, just dial star three to use the raise hand function. Next slide. Okay, and we also have um, the ASL interpretation. 
Um, we have our great interpreters here with us this morning. So just click and drag the slide bar to adjust the size of the stage window. Um, you can close any other open panels like participants, chat uh, to maximize the space on your screen and use the built-in Zoom tools to adjust the size of the presentation. All right, I'll turn it back over to Ed, thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. This next section of the presentation goes over the meeting objectives and we'll introduce our project team. The objectives of this morning's meeting is to summarize uh, the project activities and provide a status update. Uh, we also wanna walk through uh, the concept design plans. So we'll go through each of the maps. Uh, we'll start out at the southern terminus of the corridor, that's Calvert Street Northwest, and we'll proceed to the north at Legation Street. And then we want to be able to share next steps with you. As far as our project team, I, uh, myself, I'm Ed Stoloff, and I am the project manager. Cynthia Lynn is the deputy project manager. Jamie Ernst is the transportation planner for the project. Uh, many of you may know Christian Pinero. Christian is our community engagement specialist for Ward 3. Uh, when the project transitions to the design phase, Yvonne Thelwell and Jermay Kesselmichael uh, will, um, uh, from DDOT's Infrastructure Project Management Division, will take over the project. Our consultants today are Laura Mahiel and Maggie Stuthman from AMT Engineering and Charlotte Duxworth and Ian Swain providing community engagement services from community engagement. Uh, we'll have a, another meeting tomorrow night. This will be an in-person meeting. That's Wednesday, June 29th, 2022. It'll start at 6 p.m. The meeting will be at the University of the District of Columbia, 4200 Connecticut Avenue Northwest. It will be in the Student Center Building third floor ballroom. The format uh, will be as follows. We'll have a brief introductory presentation on the project status like we're having this morning. Uh, we'll present 11 maps that show the concept design. We'll disperse to our tables and then participants can speak with the project team. We'll ask that you place your comments on the large maps. And we'll also ask that you complete our Title VI form. As far as the uh, project overview, uh, we um, started the project with three goals. One, reduce vehicle crashes and improve accessibility and safety for all modes. Uh, increase multimodal accessibility by examining the possibility of a protected bicycle lane. And three, to assess the feasibility of removing the reversible lane operations. The project is part of the District of Columbia's Vision Zero initiative which aims to eliminate traffic deaths and serious injuries by 2024. As far as the uh, study area, we have a primary and secondary study area. Uh, we start at, excuse me, uh, we start out at Calvert Street on the south, and we go north to Legation Street uh, on the northern part of the corridor. We have a secondary study area, and that goes from Massachusetts Avenue on the uh, west, Western Avenue on the north, Broad Branch Road on the east, and DuPont Circle on the south. The map on the right shows you Connecticut Avenue in terms of the regional context within the Washington metropolitan area. Some of the activities performed to date, we started the project in the winter and spring 2020. We uh, looked at existing conditions, we collected data, and we conducted a data analysis. Uh, we conducted our data prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. We uh, developed initial concepts in the spring and summer of 2020. Uh, we um, continued to have a number of stakeholder meetings in the summer and throughout the fall. We did traffic analysis and modeling for the corridor. We completed concept evaluation in the winter of 2021. We had a public meeting just about a little over a year ago on March 30th, 2021 and April 1st, 2021. The public meeting comment period was between April 1st and May 8th, 2021. 
And then we had a DDOT and mayoral review period from May 9th until December 15th. Uh, we had a number of community and stakeholder and agency engagement elements of the project. We established a community advisory committee and a neighborhood. Um, uh, we had participation with the ANC commissioners. Uh, stakeholder meetings, interagency meetings with the District of Columbia and external partners. We conducted public meetings and we have our website. On the right, you can see our uh, composition of the community advisory committee members. Uh, in green, we have those um, folks that were rotated off. And then in red, we have the new CAC members. I'll leave that on just for a moment. The next two slides show um, about 50 meetings and events that we have had since the project inception. As you can see, we've had meetings with uh, numerous meetings with the ANCs, community associations, uh, institutional users such as the Smithsonian Zoo and UDC, residential property managers, and others. I could also add um, the main streets as well. Again, this is the second slide showing uh, meetings that we've had since um, the public meeting number one a year ago. And then the end of the uh, slide shows you where we are today, public meeting number two on the 28th and 29th of June, 2022. We'll continue to hold stakeholder and task force meetings after this public meeting. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about preferred concept C. On December 15th, 2021, uh, DDOT and Mayor Bowser selected concept C as the preferred alternative. And what this allows us to do, what allows DDOT to do, is to continue planning and concept development activities. It allows us to begin design procurement and allows us to complete the environmental documentation. Some of the highlights of Concept C include removal of the reversible lane system. Uh, there's two northbound and two southbound travel lanes at all times of the day. And we have one way protected bicycle lanes located on the east and west sides of the street. Um, where we have reduced bicycle buffers, we can include a left turn lane or a parking and loading lane. Other project elements include intersection left and right turn lanes, a reduction of posted speed limit from 30 to 25 miles per hour, pedestrian refuge islands and curb extensions, intersection realignments, Comprehensive review of bus stop locations, including potential bus platforms where appropriate. Consideration of pedestrian signals such as hawks and no turn on reds, prohibitions for no turn on red movements. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit of, about our work since January, 2022. We have uh, removed uh, reversible lane signs, the static signs. They were removed in March, 2022. The electronic blackout signs will be removed during the construction phase. We've also started in April, 22, to remove the reversible lane pavement markings. And we hope to complete that within a few weeks. Regarding the reduction of speed limit from 30 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour, we sent notice of intents, ANC 3C, 3F, and 34G on March 24th, 2022. We had a 10 day comment period that concluded on April 7th. And we hope to have all of the sign replacements complete by the end of the summer. The mayor's office of racial equity is conducting a racial equity impact analysis for the project. We expect the results to be available later this summer. And we um, believe that the project elements um, that the um, recommendations will be to minimize inequities such as parking for persons with disabilities, older persons and others. The equity analysis will also complete a, a demographic analysis of, of um, people in the corridor 
and compare that as well to uh, the district as a whole. Other items that we've been working on since January include um, establishing funding, developing scopes of work and procurements, developing the first iteration that you'll see today of the concept plans, and meeting with our citizen advisory committee and interagency groups during work sessions to help define some of the uh, elements of the project. Some of the immediate next steps from this summer uh, until the winter 2023. Uh, we um, uh, will refine the concept plans prior to starting the design phase. We'll conduct a comprehensive review of bus stop locations, spacing, and types, such as curbs and platforms. We'll perform a traffic calming review. We'll conduct a parking and loading optimization study. With regard to the traffic calming review, last year at our public meeting, the participants requested that we look at traffic calming on some of the area's local and collector roads. Uh, we will review and identify current traffic issues that may lend themselves to traffic calming solutions based on observations of cut through traffic, speeding, and non compliance with traffic control devices. Some locations, these are not all of the locations, but some of the locations that we may look at. Include Chevy Chase Parkway, Nevada Avenue, Utah Avenue, Linnean Avenue, Reno Road, throughout the Woodland Norman Stone neighborhood. With regard to parking and loading, um, as we said earlier, there's a guideline given that concept C is the preferred concept, that parking will be on one side of the street in commercial districts and limited parking in other areas of the corridor. We hope to establish many task forces comprised of representatives of the ANC single member districts and others. If uh, folks on the call are interested in being a part of our mini task force, please let us know. Uh, changes that we will consider include time of day usage to block faces, changes in the maximum duration of parking, establishing short term or high turnover spaces, pick up drop off areas, changes in residential parking designations. We'll look at side street use as well. Uh, there were some suggestions uh, last year uh, by the public to extend the protected bicycle lanes uh, north uh, from Legation Street to south of Chevy Chase Circle. Uh, the original northern project limits were set because the limits of the reversible lanes ended at Legation Street. What we're going to do is we're going to analyze traffic, safety, and parking, multimodal environmental data. We're going to do the same due diligence that we have done for this first phase of the project. And DDOT will make a recommendation whether to include or not to include protected bicycle lane extension for the project. DDOT will engage the community, including residents and businesses, the ANCs, and other organizations throughout this study period. Between June 22 and January 23, we will continue our design procurement. And again, we'll hope to have the design procurement complete and so that we can start design early winter. The next slide shows you a graphic of the general project timeline. So if you look to the left, you'll see concept refinement, traffic calming review, parking refinements, and the design procurement all com being completed in the next six or seven months. In calendar year 23, we'll start preliminary and final design. Calendar year 24, we'll have a construction procurement. And in cal later in calendar 24 and into calendar 25, we'll complete construction. Throughout the entire time period, you see the red bar at the bottom, we will continue public engagement activities. Now's the time. I think we'll take questions and comments on this overview period. Uh, Charlotte, would you like to uh, start? Sure, thank you, Ed. Um, let's see, Ian, I'll turn it over to you to begin with any questions. 
Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Ed, my first question is for Ms. Ann. She said, I just want to say and register formally, thank you for continuing to move forward with the bike lanes. I think it's in the past, it's past time to build out bike safety infrastructure in this part of the city. I can't wait to buy a bike now that I know my family and I can ride safely to the businesses on the corridor. Um, and it says, I hope the lanes go all the way through Chevy Chase. Thank you again. Um, and who lives, uh, who's at 30th Street Northwest. Um, thank you Anne, for your comment. That's all we have in the Q&A portion of the um, uh, box right now. Thank you, Ian. Just looks like some folks just are raising their hand. Yep, yeah, and we just had one more question, and I mean, uh, Ed and I'll turn it uh, back over. Identify people who raised their hand. Uh, thank you again. I am excited for the bike lanes to take my family safely to the shops on Connecticut Avenue. Will you extend it south of Calvert? That is not in our current. Um, thank you for your question. That's not in our current plans. Um, I think we may look at it as far part of the bicycle master plan, you know, for the District of Columbia, but at this junction, that's not in our plans. Thanks, Ed. We have another uh, comment and another question. Uh, the comment is very excited about the project and impressed with the thoroughness of the planning so far. And then the question from Nick is protected bike lanes are not safer depending on the interruptions at intersections, alleys, and driveways. He's asking, are they safer? Uh, we're going to be doing a block by block review during this design phase of um, all of the driveways. Uh, some driveways might we might uh, recommend being right in or right out. We might want to um, close certain left turns, prohibit certain left turns through the corridor. So we'll be doing a block by block review of all of the driveways uh, as it touches Connecticut Avenue. Thanks, Ed. The next question came from Mark. What happens if we find that bike lanes turn out not to be enough to merit the loss of parking for the commercial areas? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Um, no problem. Yeah. What, what happens if we find that bike lanes turn out not to be enough to merit the loss of parking for the commercial areas? Um, I think the decision has been made uh, when the uh, uh, DDOT selected concept C uh, that, um, you know, it's an acknowledgement that, um, you know, there will be a loss of parking, but we're going to do our best to mitigate that loss through changing the uh, allocations, changing the durations, um, and basically, um, you know, trying to, um, I think that's what we're going to do. We're going to uh, make sure that the parking that we have uh, is optimized uh, for the businesses and the residents and the partner. Thanks, Ed. Next question from Bossy. Um, will all bus stops use Zyfella designs or will there uh, be any floating bus stops at higher volume stops? Uh, we'll look at floating bus stops. We'll look at curb stops. Uh, that element is going to be decided in the design phase. Thanks, Ed. Next question from Nick. The curbs are critical for parking safety. PBL on the curb seem to contradict this. Um, I'm not understanding what is the question. Uh, it's just a, a statement that you want is to find out. Statement? Yeah, the, the, uh, the curbs are critical for parking safety. Will the PBL on the curb seem to contradict that? Yeah, we'll be looking at um, all parking in relation to the um, um, to the, the, the curb lanes and, and the bike lanes, and we'll be looking at the designs and the buffers to make sure everything is safe. And that will happen in the design phase. Thank you. The next question is from Sylvia. Thank you for your work. What are the enforcement measures that will ensure this new plan is safer, less polluting, and non-motorized and mo mobility friendly? Thank you, say, uh, thank you, Sylvia, for your question. Uh, we will be working uh, with the MPD as well to ensure that um, you know, with the, when we reduce the speed limits, that we can um, um, you know, enforce those speed limits. Uh, we hope uh, that part of the project after we put the speed limit signs in would be to include uh, some automated enforcement in the corridor as well. Thank you. And the next one's from Shauna. Can you talk more about your analysis of the cut through traffic impacts 
on these changes and have you looked at potential traffic impacts north of Chevy Chase Circle, Maryland side? Uh, thank you, Shauna. Um, we did a complete diversion analysis uh, in the first phase of the project. That information is on our project website. Um, and we also looked at um, uh, our regional modeling and that looked at traffic um, and how traffic would distribute itself throughout not only uh, Connecticut Avenue in Maryland, but through all of the regional roadways. So we did do a complete diversion analysis. Next one's from Bossy. Um, are there any expected PUDO needs and how is the bikeway designed at those? Uh, as I said uh, in the presentation, we are going to look at, um, um, this is PUDO is a pick up drop off uh, spaces. And um, this summer and into the fall, we'll look at block by block to see um, which areas have circular driveways, which do not, which areas uh, might lend themselves to pick up drop off spaces. So again, that'll happen throughout the summer and the fall. And as we go into the design phase. Thanks, Ed. Next one's coming from a resident near Merch. Uh, the question is, how will cut throughs like the car wash near Albemarle Street be handled? where cars often stack up along Connecticut Avenue around the corner. And then the second part of that is, will the bike lanes be designed to carry cyclists safely past this obstacle? Um, we're gonna do our best. We know that the car wash is an issue that, that we need to address. Um, it is a constraint, uh, but we'll be looking at in the design phase. We are, next question Ed is, we are strongly opposed to bike lanes because of the uh, effect on the businesses uh, and the elderly and disabled? How specifically can you mitigate the loss of hundreds of parking spaces? Uh, as I indicated earlier that um, DDOT and um, their leadership has made a decision to select concept C, which does include a reduction in parking throughout the corridor. Uh, the mitigation, as I said, we will look at trying to optimize uh, the parking uh, on the available block bases in the commercial areas, we will have only limited parking in the residential areas. Uh, from a mitigation standpoint, as I said, uh, we will um, uh, look at the durations. You know, some of the parking areas that have two hours and three and a half hour durations, we would hope that we could reduce that um, uh, duration uh, to 30 minute or 60 minutes basis to create, to create higher turnover in the corridor. Okay, and my understanding, we have some uh, hands raised. We have some additional questions in the Q and A, but I uh, want to give people an opportunity who um, are not available to put post their question in the Q and A section. Hi, Ian. So we have Amy, who's had her hand raised. Um, Molly, can we unmute Amy? Amy, you're able to pose your question. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Amy. Um, what are you going to do to make sure the bicyclists obey the traffic signals? And um, are scooters going to be in the bike lanes and will this get bikes off of the sidewalks and, and the scooters off the sidewalk? I have been walking my dog in Connecticut Avenue and had bicyclists shout at me, get out of the way, old lady. So I'd like to know how you're going to protect the seniors and whether you're going to enforce making bicyclists stop at the red lights. Uh, thank, thank you, Amy. Yeah, thank you, Amy, for your question. Uh, we um, um, hope that the scooters will also be in the bike lanes. Uh, and by getting the scooters and the bicycles off the sidewalks, that should make uh, it safer for, for everyone. As far as your question with regard to bicyclists obeying the traffic signals, um, DDOT will, um, as always, we are looking at educational campaigns um, to um, talk to bikers and talk to autos as well, making sure that we can have civility um, as in, in our entire transportation system. I think it's civility both ways. Thank you, Ed. Um, we also have a Richard Pollock, Richard as well, who has had his hand raised. 
can we can we unmute Richard? Richard, you're now unmuted to pose your question. Great. Um, I'd like to know, first of all, if you have done any kind of a survey of business members, business owners whose shops are on the Connecticut Avenue corridor, and if so, what results have you found from the business community? And I have a follow up. Just you mentioned a regional analysis of possible overflow of cars to neighborhoods. Uh, can the public get a copy of that regional analysis? Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, we did do a um, in the phase one of the study. We did do a survey of the business owners, and I think um, um, the survey is still up actually on our website. Um, the results are that uh, the business owners were concerned about the reduction of parking. Uh, with regard to the regional analysis, uh, yes, that is also on our website. We went over that in uh, last year's public meeting back in March and April of 2021. And um, we can surely direct you to um, that analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And let me also recognize um, Hannah, if we can unmute Hannah. Hannah, you're now unmuted. What is the funding source and how much um, will this project cost? Uh, the construction estimate is about seven point uh, seven million dollars, and it's local funds. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Um, and we have one call-in user as well. Um, can we unmute the call in user? It's a 202 and it starts off 909. Hi, um, I'm calling in to ask about what are the responsibilities that you are going to ask bicyclists to do? For example, they are getting, you know, a third of Connecticut Avenue, so to speak. Are they going to have to register their bikes, pay taxes, have license plates, and they will often, I assume, exceed the speed limit of 25 if you reduce it. How are you going to enforce the same traffic rules that you want for cars on bicycles? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, that's actually um, not part of this study itself, uh, but I guess um, if, if Will is on, if Will, if Will Hansfield is on, maybe Will or Mike can um, talk to that bit. The question was, how will we get cyclists to, I think I heard, obey a 25 mile speed limit, what they're doing to um, uh, receive a third of the overall right of way space? And did I miss one? I think something about complying with the, the laws. In general, when we plan for protected bus facilities, we get significantly higher bicycle use, significantly higher compliance with the the rules and uh, regulations of the roadway. Um, our goal for the city is to increase bicycle trips while reducing car trips. That's a broad, you know, um, sustainable DC goal and move DC goal. Um, this moves us in that direction in a significant way. As a former uh, resident of the Connecticut Avenue corridor, I can say, you know, when when cyclists are in the street, it's a pretty stressful experience and. Um, as, as safety measures, it was contingent upon everybody who's riding in the street to, to look out for their own safety. And not everyone was able to. There were a lot of um, crashes over the years. But, uh, but with this project, I think it's going to be safer for everyone. I think one of the earlier comments was about sidewalk riding. Um, I just worked on a project with a, with a different type of bike lanes, but we saw uh, about an 80% reduction in sidewalk riding once we installed this, this type of bike lane. And that's pretty consistent across um, many projects where once we have something that's safe uh, and appropriate in the roadway, uh, cyclists and scooter riders choose to use that facility. And I wanna say something about the 30% of the, the right of way. So when we have an arterial corridor, principal arterial corridor like Connecticut Avenue, um, our design guidance and the federal design guidance um, uh, very strongly leads to a protected bike facility, which is which is what uh, what we have planned for this corridor, uh, and those do take up a little extra space because of the buffer zone, the protected nature of it. Um, so that that's a 
a, a common feature that you'll see um, throughout the, the city in a, in a growing rate, uh, more and more protected bike lanes as we try to put piece together a network that uh, spans the entire city. Um, I think I covered most of the uh, the themes. Ed, did you want did you want me to cover yeah, anything yeah. else? Yeah, uh, thanks, Will. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. So we do have some more questions um, in the Q and A, and a couple of more raised hands. Um, we are going to come back to these questions, you all, when we come to the next Q and A portion. Um, we're going to go through the concept maps, and so um, so please note that we will go back to the questions. Um, but we're going to go back. We're going to go back to the next phase of this presentation. Ed, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Charlotte. So again, this is just a, a cover slide, a title slide. Uh, Laura Mahil from AMT Engineering will take over now, and uh, um, Laura will go through eleven maps and um, um, try to answer some of your questions with regard to some of the design elements in the corridor. Laura. And I'm going to go ahead and get this situated here to share the maps. And can everybody hear me okay? And if anybody's yes, Laura, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. okay. Do this and okay. So first, I would like to walk you through how to interpret how to interpret the various concept elements presented in the drawings. Um, starting with the legend, the legend does define the specific concept features. Um, upper left, you can see self-explanatory likely. The, uh, there's signals that have a signal, a little symbol there. And below that, we have uh, an existing bus stop with a little transit vehicle in orange, and it has a CC next to it. That CC indicates it's a candidate for consolidation with other nearby bus stops, and that's through um, close coordination with WMATA. Below that, we have a couple of different shades of orange, BS-E with the light orange is a bus stop that's generally remaining where it is today, and BS-R will be a relocated location. And generally, those are being relocated to what we're, we call a far side bus stop. Uh, and a far side bus stop is at the um, at the opposite side of the intersection, once the bus crosses the intersection, they have their stop there, and that's noted as a far side. Those are um, generally found to be more um, more safe for pedestrians and also uh, can optimize the bus uh, timing. Uh, the RM in, in a gray colored shade is indicating a raised median. Uh, again, those are at an intersection uh, and a few, a few different intersections of our project. Um, and those are to help with uh, pedestrian safety as they go across the, side, the crosswalk. Uh, that we do have a couple of different um, features for bicycles shown. Uh, the green uh, on, on the left there, the green hatch line marks across the intersections, and then what was just circled in red, um, some queuing and, and intersection space bike boxes. Uh, these these are just um, shown really uh, sparingly in the concept, but but certainly other intersections will um, address this in, in detail uh, during the design phase, but we have shown them in the termination of the, of the project at either end, we've, we've shown how the, that would work. Again, there will be um, more of that uh, in design and, and more of those features added. Uh, after the, uh, on the lower left there, you'll see a few different colored shapes, <laughs> excuse me, um, those would indicate the parking spaces that are being Picked it on the plans. Uh, when, when it's a sort of a light pink, it's it's the non-metered style uh, space. The green is the metered space. The purple is the pickup, drop-off, or loading uh, areas. And then when there are hatching uh, lines shown, this is when there's restricted parking at, at certain times of the day. Uh, now to the right side of the um, uh, legend bunch of acronyms there. BB indicates the, the bicycle buffer, and then we would show a width for that on the drawing as well. NTOR is the um, no, no turn on red uh, designation. DLT, DRT, those are the dedicated left and right turn lanes uh, for vehicles to turn. 
uh, a hawk being written is a um, uh, indicates that the the um, the area the crossing will be evaluated further for a possible hawk installation during design. Uh, I talked about the IBQV RIRO is a right in right out for a driveway that uh, may have uh, complete access today. There's that may occur through um, at one location we're showing on the concept now. Uh, and then GE, those indicate uh, different geometric um, modifications to, to intersections, to roadways that um, will help uh, improve safety and the operation of the overall corridor. I'm going to go ahead and move into concept plan one. And there are a total of 11 drawings. And um, we do ask um, if you could, when you, uh, when you pose a question in, in Q&A, if you would designate the drawing number, the plan number, that would be helpful um, if, if you can do that, if it does apply to a specific thing. Um, so starting from the south, this first drawing, plan one, generally covers the corridor from Calvert Street to Woodley Road. Each of those two intersections, and I'll zoom in a little bit, Calvert and Woodley both um, indicate left turn lanes, dedicated left turn lanes uh, on the northbound approach and then also on the southbound approach at, at Calvert. Right turn on, no right turn on red will be designated. Uh, we do call for high visibility crosswalks at all crossings and that actually is true throughout the corridor. 24th Street will be reconfigured to intersect Connecticut Avenue in a safer fashion, more of a 90 degree angle. Uh, and uh, no dedicated turn lanes are um, warranted on the 24th Street intersection um, from Connecticut. Because of the intersection turn lanes uh, at these two closely spaced intersections, the new bike lanes in this section will be four feet wide and have one and a half foot wide buffer adjacent to the driving lane. Um, and then you'll see there are a, a handful of parking and um, loading zones shown there on the eastern curb and the bike lane next to the, that location will have a two and a half foot buffer, uh, which will um, help with uh, safety of, with doors swinging open from the passenger side of the car. So that concludes a brief description of plan sheet one. In fact, I, I probably should have mentioned here, I'll do it on plan sheet two. Um, the top is the existing condition that's out there. Well, that, that existed prior to the uh, reversible lanes being removed. Um, and the bottom is the proposed concept. So you may have gathered that when I had the previous uh, plan up. I apologize for not mentioning that earlier. So here on this next plan, um, this is the corridor between Woodley Road and Hawthorne Street, which encompasses the intersections also of Garfield Street and Cathedral Avenue. Um, Cathedral is really is the only other inter, uh, signalized intersection on this uh, portion. And it does uh, require a left turn lane, dedicated left turn lane for vehicles traveling southbound. Uh, and then we have uh, parking accommodated on, we're showing it on the eastern curb line through this segment. Um, and we, um, I just want to remind you that, you know, as Ed mentioned, there will be the uh, parking optimization study, very block by block, very detailed coordinating with um, ANC representatives and, and adjacent owners and other interested parties to define locations, uh, type of parking, type of, you know, whether it's pickup drop off, metered parking, restricted or not. Um, and that, that will all be then uh, superimposed and, and incorporated into the design concept. Um, as that takes place uh, in the second half of this year. Uh, in this section, because of the, where the parking lane is noted, again, we have four foot bike lanes and a two and a half foot buffer to the uh, between the bike lane and the parking lane. And on the opposite side, four foot bike lane 
with a one and a half foot buffer. And uh, all of these dimensions have been um, developed so that we hold the curb lines where they are today. Uh, and you sort of have to make everything fit. Uh, and so that's why we allocated the um, space the way we have shown it. So that completes, um, actually it doesn't complete the description of <laughs> plan two. I wanted to indicate one more thing. Uh, the bus stops at this, uh, in this section at Cathedral, we do have um, a far side bus stop proposed for the northbound direction. You can kind of see that dark orange BS-R there on the lower uh, drawing and then the existing drawing, it was on the opposite side as a, as a near side bus stop. It will be, um, we're anticipating that becoming a far side bus stop. Mm -hmm. Moving to drawing three, uh, this depicts the corridor between Hawthorne Street and Macomb Street, uh, um, both of which uh, those streets are both off just off of the drawing, uh, but they straddle um, this section of the corridor. Uh, the major pedestrian crossing for the zoo at Olmsted Walk is within this segment, uh, as, as are the vehicular zoo uh, entrance at North Road and another uh, signalized intersection at Devonshire Place. As with all crosswalks on the project, uh, we are using high, visib high visibility style markings. Um, there are no turn lanes needed um, on this segment, no dedicated turn lanes, which affords the opportunity to put some uh, parking and pick up drop off space. Um, again, we're showing on the Eastern um, curb line. We also show a, uh, a bump out that GE2, sort of a curb extension uh, type of an improvement there at the crosswalk uh, to the zoo. This is to prevent illegal parking from occurring and blocking the crosswalk. And there will, be, of course, be uh, appropriate ADA access across that, um, that curb line with the pressed curbs and detectable surfaces. Uh, once the project uh, proceeds onto the the bridge over the Kringle Valley uh, Trail and Stream Valley. Um, of course, no parking is permitted on the bridge. And this is the first instance where we have no turn lanes and no parking, and this allows greater space for the bicycle uh, lanes and buffers, a total of nine feet on either side for the buffer and bike lane provide, uh, combined. And um, currently we're showing that as a five foot bike lane with a four foot buffer. Bus stops in this segment uh, generally remain in their current locations with the exception of the, um, the stop at the zoo crosswalk, which we propose to shift to the opposite side, the northbound, um, the northbound bus stop there at the zoo crosswalk. So that's plan drawing three. Moving to, to plan four, this is between Macomb Street and Porter Street. Uh, this segment reflects a current streetscape and drainage improvement at Cleveland Park, which uh, is under construction currently. And that um, is superimposed onto the drawing, both in the existing map up above and the, and the proposed in the uh, concept. There's a, a, a hawk signal today, uh, uh, just south of Ordway, and that will remain in our concept. So dedicated left turn lanes are proposed uh, at, at the northbound approach to Macomb, which you see here, to the far right, and at the southbound approach to Porter at the far left. We also have a dedicated right turn lane onto Porter from uh, moving from south to north. So um, with these intersections being sort of spread out, we do have room in between the two without dedicated turn lanes. Um, Broadway has no dedicated turn lanes, so we do have the ability to um, include parking in this segment as well. And we're again showing that on the eastbound curb. Um, again, that location may change, the type of parking designation may change. As the, um, as the optimization study is conducted. 
The bike lane widths on this segment are four feet wide throughout uh, with two and a half buffers next to the parking lanes and one and a half buffers otherwise. And then bus stops in this segment, again, they generally may remain in their current locations. And by the way, um, it, it does say it, we are maintaining them in their current locations. However, I think Ed mentioned a variety of amenities and upgrades that the bus stops will receive. So, um, you know, it, we acknowledge that that is going to happen, even if the bus stop remains in its generally in its current location. Uh, but the one that we are showing um, shifting is at Macomb Street in the northbound direction on the far right. Zoom in a little bit here too. Oops. There it is. Um, and that one again, we're we're proposing a far side um, for that location. So that is drawing four. Go ahead and move to drawing five, from which um, addresses the corridor between Porter Street and Tilden Street. And those streets are just off the edges of this drawing. Sedgwick Street is the only signal in this segment. Addition, uh, we haven't already discussed. And I'm zooming in here on the far left, you see Sedgwick Street and that it does show a dedicated left turn lane for vehicles traveling northbound. Posing that left turn lane on the north side of the intersection, we have shown a raised island, which will improve safety for pedestrians crossing Connecticut Avenue. This segment, here it is a little zoomed in here of, of the island. Um, this segment does not include um, any on-street parking uh, in the concept. Again, that'll be fully vetted and uh, developed uh, further in the optimization study. Um, so with the elimination of the parking and no turn lanes that are needed throughout the majority of this segment, we're able to carry the five foot wide bicycle lanes and the four foot wide buffers through these limits um, in all areas except at the Sedgwick Street intersection. And then for bus stops in this segment, we do propose consolidating them. Let me go back here. This is showing the bus stops um, that are being uh, proposed here at Sedgwick Street. We, um, we have them basically as both as far as far side bus stops on either side of Sedgwick Street. And we are already coordinating with Mamata on bus stop locations with their operation and their um, and their uh, their needs, and we will continue to do that through design. And things may be refined in terms of bus stop uh, locations through that design phase. So that is the summary of drawing five. I'm going to drawing six now, which depicts the corridor between Tilden Street on the right and VZ Terrace on the left. Um, both of those are signalized intersections, and we do have another signal in this limit at Van Ness Street and an uh, unsignalized intersection at Upton Street. Okay, both uh, Tilden and Van Ness require left turn lanes, as shown, in, and a new median island. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go to this. There we go. New Median Island is indicated um, opposite Van Ness uh, on the on this direction that doesn't require a left turn lane. We show that Median Refuge Island. I'm going to go back to this this section here. Um, this is the section between. Um, just north of Tilden and uh, running past um, Upton Street onto the north. In this area, um, the team has already flagged a possibility of integrating some pickup and drop off space on the western curb. We wanted to see how that could be, um, you know, as, as things are refined, both, you know, in design and in this study that we 
um, are going to perform for the parking optimization, what would it look like to incorporate some sort of parking or, or loading space? And so this is the, the block without any parking or loading. And here's an option um, to incorporate some pickup, drop off loading, uh, approaching on either side of Upton Street, what that would do to the rest of the cross section. Uh, and so we just wanted to highlight that that's the type of exercise that'll occur in, in areas as we determine the need for such, such a revision. Um, so the parking lanes, I'm sorry, the bike lanes in these segments are as the others were, where we don't have any um, parking we can use four foot wide, four foot wide buffers and five foot wide bike lanes. Where we have parking, we'll have a four foot wide bike lane and a two and a half foot buffer. And then on the opposite side of, of those parking lane areas, we drop to a one and a half foot buffer. Bus stops in this segment um, are, are currently shown to be consolidated. Um, you'll see there's currently there's bus stops at Van Ness. WMATA has indicated they'd like those consolidated at Tilden and at VZ Terrace. Um, and we do show those in that fashion on these um, drawings, on this drawing. That's drawing six, and we're going to move to drawing seven, which carries us north of VZ Terrace and proceed to up to Albemarle Street, which is signalized. We do have Wyndham Place and Yuma Street um, in this segment, two other signals. And the only dedicated turn lane in this segment is a right turn lane onto Albemarle Street from the south. I think I have a zoom in. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, uh, for parking and loading, uh, our concept accommodates some parking in this section as well. For the purposes of the concept, we just basically maintain the same type of parking, which is the non-metered uh, on the uh, on the plan here on the north side of Wyndham Place and metered on the south side. And um, I believe that mimics existing, if I'm not mistaken. But again, all of those features of the parking Types, et cetera, will be um, finalized in that in the study. Um, so the, the existence of the parking lanes again does uh, require the two and a half foot buffers for the bike lanes, and then on the opposite side, a one and a half foot buffer. Um, bus stops in this segment uh, are again, to be relocated and consolidated in accordance with this plan. Um, as candidates for con consolidation uh, based on WMATA, uh, Yuma Street uh, bus stop will be um, consolidated to, you know, on either on either side using either Albemarle uh, or, um, or uh, VZ Terrace ha ha has, a, has one on the prior sheet. And a far side bus stop is proposed at Albemarle Street in the northbound direction. So that's drawing seven. Move to drawing eight, which begins north of Albemarle Street and proceeds to Davenport Street, which is signalized. Um, altogether, there are six intersections within a 1700 foot distance in this segment. Brandywine Street is another signalized intersection in these limits. Uh, Appleton Street, Chesapeake Street, and Cumberland Street all stopped controlled intersections. Uh, our initial study has shown that no dedicated turn lanes are warranted in this section of Connecticut Avenue. We currently recommend no turn on red at the intersection with Davenport. Again, other intersections may receive the same recommendation uh, throughout through the design process. Uh, we there. Um, we do not indicate any parking on street parking in this segment, and therefore we currently um, are allowed or afforded the opportunity to have wider uh, bike lanes and, and bike buffers. The stop controlled intersection at let's see, yeah at uh, at Chesapeake there on the left is a candidate for a Hawk 
crossing. There's no there's no signal there today, but we we do uh, we have gotten comments and requests and are looking into the possibility of a pedestrian hawk signal there. Another view of that. Um, and then through coordination with Lamada, we are keeping the bus stops um, at Davenport sort of where they are today with upgrades and um, features to be incorporated in design. And I think the other bus stops there at Brandywine um, are being shown as being relocated as far side bus stops. So that summary of drawing number eight. Drawing number nine begins north of Davenport Street and proceeds to Nebraska Avenue, which is another signalized intersection. Um, in this segment, another sort of busy section of the corridor, we have six intersections and 1600 feet. Um, Pheasant, Pheasanton Street is the third signalized intersection in this segment in the middle there. Ellicott, Everett, and 36th Streets all stop controlled intersections. And note that an existing signal, signalized pedestrian crossing is there today at Ellicott Street. Um, it's shown on the on the right hand side. I think I can zoom in. Actually, let me let me do these first. Turn lanes. Um, the only turn lane we indicate as needed here is a dedicated right lane from from the north heading southbound uh, onto Nebraska Avenue. And here's the um, here's the Ellicott Street uh, with the existing Hawk. Uh, signal that's there today that will remain. I'm going to go ahead and back up now to Nebraska and describe a um, an improvement that we anticipate incorporating into the design. GE3 will um, attempt to uh, eliminate that dedicated what we call a slip lane for the right turning vehicles and have the cars uh, turn at the signal to improve safety for um, really for all all modes. Um, this will, will require some uh, um, reorienting of the crosswalks and uh, and make it to make that work. But we've checked turning movements, uh, the way the turn the vehicles turn, uh, and how they would their path that they would use. And we think this this looks like a a, a good option to, to carry into design. Uh, so this section does show some parking spaces to remain. Um, again, that'll further be developed in uh, in the study. And the bike lanes and buffers, same as the other segments, we have five foot wide lanes, bike lanes with four foot buffers, as shown on the right hand side there, uh, where there's no parking or dedicated lanes interfering with that. And otherwise, the two and a half foot buffers next to the parking lane, if there's a, a parking lane there, the bike has the two and a half foot buffer. And one and a half foot buffer opposite side of the curb. Bus stops in this segment, um, similar to other segments described, will be relocated as far stop, far side bus stops in the northbound direction and are generally remaining in their existing location in the southbound direction. So that includes drawing nine, and we're going on to drawing 10 begins north of Nebraska Avenue and proceeds to Jocelyn Street. Altogether, six intersections again in a 1500 foot segment. Um, Jennifer Street is the second uh, in a lot, uh, second um, signalized intersection um, and Huntington as well signalized in these limits. And we also have Harrison and Gamar uh, and Jocelyn, which I, I mentioned earlier that they are all stop controlled. We zoom in. So turn lanes, um, we do have a turn lane onto Huntington Street for a left, a left turn in the northbound direction. And opposite that, we are able to provide a raised median again for pedestrian refuge there uh, crossing Connecticut Avenue. Uh, the stop controlled intersection of Jocelyn and Connecticut Avenue is a candidate again for another uh, hawk. Um, 
enhanced pedestrian crossing. Uh, all, pro all proposed crosswalks, I'll remind you again, are um, going to be marked with high visibility style markings. So other than a few pick up and drop off and parking spaces there in front of the Montessori school, there there is no other on street parking posed in this segment. Uh, bike lanes and buffers, same as the other segments. Uh, five plus four, I'll call it five plus four, where no parking or intersections interfere with that uh, dimension. And uh, two and a half foot buffers next to the parking. One and a half foot buffers otherwise. Bus stops at this at, in this segment um, are shown to be relocated relocated at Jocelyn to move closer to the signal at Jennifer. So basically, the Jocelyn bus stop you see at the up, upper left, um, and then the lower left you can see the dark orange shapes, and that's the uh, relocated. We're pushing those a little closer to the signal um, in, co in coordination with, with LaMada's uh, request. So that's drawing 10. And finally, drawing 11. Drawing 11 begins north of Jocelyn Street and proceeds to legation, current limit. Um, it does include the intersection of Military Road, another signal, and um, Kanawa Street, uh, which is the stop sign. So dedicated left turns are needed at Military Road um, in both directions in our traffic analysis. And we are currently not depicting any parking in this segment. Again, this is going to be reviewed in the study. Bike lanes and buffers, very much a repeat of the prior segments. Um, five foot lanes, four foot buffers, such as on the left side, approaching legation. Uh, Four foot with one and a half foot buffers at the intersection there at military because of the tighter space. And there are um, two bus stops in this segment the, at military, um, one, one in each direction. Uh, and the one in southbound is going to remain in its current location, and the one northbound will be uh, is shown to be shifted as a far side bus stop. And that is drawing 11. And that does conclude my overview of the concept. I think now we'll go back to um, Charlotte for you to navigate the Q and A. Thank you, Laura. Um, so yes, we do have some questions here in the Q and A. Um, Ian, I will turn it over to you to read off a few of the questions for Laura. Thank you, uh, Charlotte. We'll continue where we left off. Uh, and please note that some of your questions have been answered in the Q and A portion by the different project team members. Uh, those who haven't, we will definitely address. Uh, thanks again. So we'll start off uh, with uh, Ed. This question is for you. Uh, Connecticut Avenue is an emergency evacuation route. How is it being taken into consideration? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, we have FEMS, uh, the uh, fire and emergency management uh, folks uh, on our interagency task force, and we'll be working with them throughout the design process to ensure uh, safety for emergency vehicles. Thanks, Ed. How will, be, how will the disabled be impacted with this plan and what was the image on your flyers uh, to represent? Uh, the, um, we will, the parking that we will be um, accommodating uh, in the commercial areas and others, we will um, look um, at uh, spaces for the disabled uh, community as well as older persons. So you know, we'll be looking block by block to ensure that um, uh, we have uh, parking spaces for um, disabled. And also, can I add that um, we, of course, will uh, incorporate ADA uh, uh, crossings at, at, at all at all crosswalks. And, and from the sidewalk down to the crosswalks um, and all 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 entrances that the sidewalks uh, feed into, of course, uh, ADA will be fully met. Thanks, uh, Laura and Ed. Uh, Laura, this question is for you. Do you have a total number of removed parking spaces um, from this plan? I don't have a number handy. Um, there. 
I believe, uh, Ed, will the plans be yeah. available? Yeah, yeah they will be. Um, there's approximately 400 throughout the entire 2.7 mile segment. But I believe we maintain some of that, right? There's not 400 in the, in the roof. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get the exact number of the project spaces we moved, and and that will that will change um, could change substantially as we complete our parking optimization study through the summer, the fall. Thanks, Ed. Next question: uh, What is the plan for the semi-permanent restaurant seating in the small commercial strip across from Politics and Pros near Fessenden? Um, I don't have that answer, but um, I will uh, get that answer for. Um... Thanks. Ed. Next question. With the rush hour flow going from 4 to 2 lanes, it seems like there will be significant overflow traffic diverting through adjacent neighborhoods. What have the studies shown this on? How will this be handled? We did a complete traffic analysis and um, diversion analysis, as I said earlier, uh, and um, we actually did what we call a level of service analysis uh, for traffic operations. And uh, we found that um, at least in the traditional traffic engineering parlance, uh, you know, our level of service was um, okay for um, all of the intersections. We looked at 44 intersections in the corridor. And I believe there were five to eight intersections that kind of were below um, a level of service uh, D. Um, so the majority of our intersections, our signalized intersections, uh, were above a level of service D or above. Thanks, Ed. Will there be a PUDO at Sunrise Assisted Living? Often ambulance and fire trucks are parked here to respond to emergencies. And it came out, I'm sorry, it came out garbled. Um, I, I apologize. Will there be a PUDO at Sunrise Assisted Living Facilities? Often ambulance fire trucks are parked here to respond to emergencies. Again, we'll work with uh, fire and emergency management services to ensure uh, safety and accessibility for fire trucks and ambulances. Next question, will the existing street strategies, e.g. on the west side, south of Nebraska, be eliminated? Um, I may have been, some computer problems. May, Laura, if you heard that, can you repeat that question for me, maybe? I didn't hear what was asked to be eliminated. I heard something is something to be eliminated, but I didn't get what it was either. I think it broke up. Streeteries uh, is what they refer to along um, the west side, south of Nebraska. Be eliminated. We aren't proposing doing anything behind the curb. Is that does that other than yes. bus stop improvements? Does that answer that concern? Yes, it does. Yeah. Every, everything that's being shown here is basically curb to curb, other than bus stop um, amenities and features that may be behind the curb. The next question, will the car lanes be narrower than they are now? No, uh, they'll be remain at 10 feet. Uh, with one exception, uh, left turn lanes um, can be 9 feet. Okay. Will the red light camera be installed at every intersection? These cameras are necessary, especially for scooter and bike, bike traffic along the traditional uh, motorized vehicles. No, um, we'll evaluate um, potential locations for red light cameras or speed cameras, uh, the automated enforcement cameras along the corridor. Uh, they definitely will not be at every location, but we'll look for, you know, a few locations uh, that, that, that make sense and where we can fit them in. Next question, how will this plan accommodate motorcades? Um, I don't have the exact answer to that question. We can come back to you with, with that. I'm sure uh, just like any other arterial, um, uh, motorcades are given the priority um, as, as, as it, they go forward. But you know, I can get you the specific 
answer to that. Laura, if you can uh, queue up uh, number three, um, it's a question related to uh, the street in front of the zoo. I mean, the portion in front of the zoo. It says on drawing three in front of the zoo, I believe that there are at this point no pickup and drop off spots for zoo visitors arriving via taxi, personal cars, and ride shares, and also no special spots for school buses and commercial tour buses. At this point, will you be studying needs for the almost 2 million zoo visitors for accommodations on Connecticut Avenue? So yeah, yes, this is an area where we've actually already anticipated um, the need for adding pickup and drop off um, where today there is none as, as mentioned. And so in this blow up, you can kind of see on the right, um, some space in purple. Uh, that would be accommodating uh, that exact uh, curbside usage. And um, and this is probably a, a key location in the parking optimization study that uh, Ed and I have mentioned numerous times that that uh, will need to be fully vetted uh, in terms of demand here and, and what can be accommodated. Uh, there's limited frontage, so you only have so much curb space, uh, but we're we're maximizing that for both for the bus and the and pickup drop off as we show in the current um, concept. Uh, thanks, Laura. And, and one other comment: uh, we did work with the zoo uh, and present them with some of our initial concepts early on in the study, and we'll continue to work with the zoo, uh, the Smithsonian Zoo folks, uh, when we uh, uh, finalize our designs uh, for the corridor here. Thanks, Laura. And it uh, the next question, in order to accommodate PUDOs for the elderly disabled, will the sidewalk be narrowed in certain areas? Laura, can you answer that? Um, I, I imagine that there could be some sort of iteration that looks at that option as the parking optimization study. And we, I keep saying parking optimization, it's not just parking, it's really curbside usage, right? It's loading and, and pick up drop off. Um, that um, if it makes sense and if it works within the DDOT uh, parameters for, for pedestrian um, and sidewalk space, that could be an option. It isn't currently, um, and you know, we don't currently have that uh, as, a, as, a, um, as a feature of the project, uh, but it's, I would say, not completely off the table, Ed, if you would agree. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me skip down to the next question. Has anyone studied additional parking, bicycle uh, parking along the corridor to accommodate additional bike usage, or is that beyond the study scope? Uh, I think um, bicycle parking uh, will definitely be part of the comprehensive look of of the uh, bicycle and pedestrian needs you know, as we go forth in design. So. You know, we have uh, um, staff in, in our department that, that look at bicycle parking every day, and we'll make sure that that's included uh, as part of this study. Thanks, Eric. Next question, will there be any planted medians added on Connecticut Avenue? I do not anticipate that the medians we're showing will be planted. They're fairly narrow um, and small and wouldn't necessarily support uh, well, certainly not trees, but I mean, there could be, uh, this would have to be maintenance and UFA um, discussion. I, I would imagine they're going to be concrete. There are only very few small spots where we even have room to put them. And I, I imagine that they will probably be concrete. Thank you. Uh, Ed, in general, uh, and Laura, a question was posed. Can you comment further on traffic analysis? Uh, as I said, we did an extensive traffic analysis uh, in the first phase of the project. Um, this summer and the fall, we're going to go back and uh, look at some of the locations that the public ask us to look at again. Uh, some of the locations might be residential and some collector roads where traffic calming might uh, lend themselves to certain solutions. Um, but we have our full traffic analysis um, uh, in our presentations uh, from a year ago, and I'd be happy to uh, 
show um, the individual uh, where they are. Thanks, uh, Laura's questions for you. The intersection of Connecticut and legation is a dangerous crossing for pedestrians as well as vehicles turning onto Connecticut. Will you consider a passenger refuge island there or other traffic calming safety feature? Okay, so I'm looking. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm looking at it to see what can be done. Um, well, it actually, with the with the width of the bike lanes here at the legation, and the, and this being the termination, it may it may change. Right, we may we may terminate um, further north depending on that additional study. There does appear to be some flexibility in the cross section to incorporate. Uh, turn hardening or some other feature to protect and slow down, you know, protect better protect pedestrians, slow, slow cars down because the, uh, the lane, the bike lane width and buffer is wider here and has some flexibility to, to perhaps be skinnied up to afford a, a solution such as that. So we will take a note of that concern, um, and, uh, make sure we, uh, address that and look into that during the next phase. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Ed and Laura and uh, Will, there are a few questions uh, along the corridor, um, particular uh, related to bicycle parking, and will that feature be accommodated uh, and looked at further through this study? Uh, DDOT uh, has a current program that adds bike parking um, with the goal of a thousand new bike parking uh, installations per year. And um, typically when we do uh, projects of this magnitude, we look for uh, any and all opportunities to add bike bike parking throughout the corridor. Um, and so I, I know we can apply that that existing programs resources to this area. Um, it can happen a little bit before the project starts or is completed, but uh, certainly, you know, as we get more cycles in the corridor, um, we we generally do add uh, a significant amount of bike parking. Thanks again. Uh, well for your response. Um, Charlotte, do you want me to turn it over to you for our hands raised? Sure. Thanks, Ian. Um, we do have a couple of hands raised, um, and then we will try to get back to um, some of the other questions. There are quite, you know, a few questions in the chat. So, um, I'm sorry, in the Q&A. So, we will try to get to your questions as soon as we can. Um, Amy, let can we unmute Amy so that she can ask her question? Yes, um, could you elaborate on the reduction in the number of seconds to cross Connecticut Avenue that you've alluded to? It's already difficult for some of us, especially older folks to get across the street in 25 seconds. And that is very disturbing to me. And I wondered if you if you checked with um, older people um, when you designed this. And um, is is there any reason? Is there anything at this point that could stop this project? But I'm very concerned with with um, the reduction in the number of seconds to cross. That's that it, it's already too short for many of us. Thank you. I can answer some of that, but I don't know if Christine uh, Mayor is available or E are either one of you available to perhaps start the answer to that. Hi, Ed. Uh, this is E from D. Uh, I, I I think I can help to answer this question. And uh, this is E. Zhao from D. Traffic Engineering Div uh, Division. And uh, to your question, uh, I think in general, like we will. For the existing condition, uh, as we can see from the our signal records, the uh, current like pedestrian crossing time is roughly about thirty seconds along through the corridors uh, to cross the 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 uh, Connecticut Avenue this uh, east west direction. So, like in the future condition, what we were trying to see is like for those locations things we have the lane reduction. Then in that case. We will shorten the crossing times for the pedestrians to cross the streets instead of the directly reduce the crossing, uh, uh, the pedestrian crossing signal timing. Uh, 
So that's that's my understanding here. And Ed, please just add it if I interpreted this thing wrong. Yeah. Thank you. And there was another part of the question, Amy. Yes, um, I'm not. I don't think that's appropriate to be reducing the number of seconds for people with strollers or walkers to cross the street. It's absolutely unacceptable. But um, I'm wondering if you checked with um, seniors when you um, devised this plan and if there's anything at this point we could do to stop this project going forward. Thank you. Uh, we had a the uh, past chair of the pedestrian advisory uh, committee. Um, uh, council uh, on our um, community advisory committee. So um, uh, she um, uh, ensured that took into account all uh, aspects of uh, timing for, for seniors. And we will do that as we get closer to uh, the project design. So once we have a design and then it'll go to ease kind of group to look at the, um, the signal timing again. So it'll be an iterative process uh, once we, until we have a final design, uh, as far as stopping the project, the, uh, as I said, DDOT and, and, and the mayor has selected, uh, concept C, the preferred concept. So that, that, that's a no. I just want to clarify quickly what, uh, what you said, the Christine mayor from, uh, yeah, vision zero team. I mean, the, the, the decision has been made to proceed with concept C. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, I wanted to clarify what you said. We are not reducing the time that you get to cross the street. Uh, we're gonna look at, at ways to um, add time where appropriate, um, but we are reducing the distance that you have to cross the street. Um, so the crossing distance will be reduced, not the time that you have. I don't understand that. Hey Amy, uh, ACC again. I think I can further help to answer your address your question. So yeah, firstly, our currently signal crossing timing has been um, just calculated based on the federal regulations, and we're currently use the three point five this uh, crossing speed and to determine like how many seconds like we need to clearance the the to make sure like the the pedestrian can. Uh, finish that crosswalk, and in the future, if you can see this diagram, and, and actually the crossing distance has been reduced, right? And uh, I think what Ed just meant to say is like we're not reducing the real crossing time, but we're reducing the pedestrian to present on that crosswalk to crossing that street. To cross that street. Does it make sense to you? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, we also have David who has his hand raised. Can we unmute David? David, you're now unmuted. Uh, yeah, good morning. Thank you for conducting this session. It's been very helpful. I understand that. Uh, the intention is to, to push forward with this project. Um, I obviously, well, not obviously, I have a number of concerns about it. Most specifically, uh, one, the traffic that's going to dump, especially under Reno, a two lane road with three or four schools um, that would otherwise stay on Connecticut. And I know you've in particular uh, talked a little bit about this. I've heard suggestions that you'll quote study the issue. I don't really know what that means though, when 7,000 additional cars during rush hour are dumped onto that road, which at time can have half mile, mile backups. So number one, my question is in connection with commuters who are on Reno and in particular kids who are walking to and from school, how are you going to address those problems in particular? And um, yeah, I, and then number two, I would add uh, a sense of meaningful frustration that this process felt very much like uh, it, it came together last minute without meaningful community involvement. I know that, for example, the last commenter 
talked a little bit about pedestrian access. And the answer was we had a former commissioner of a pedestrian safety committee. Sure, but those aren't community folks um, at the end of the day. My second question, and apologize for, for rambling a little bit. My second question is in particular around the number of bikes that you expect to be going up and down Connecticut. The same thing happened uh, to 15th Street about a decade ago. Not a lot of bikes go up and down that street. And I'm wondering, especially in that area, there's a much younger population as compared to upper Northwest. How many folks you're expecting to be uh, taking their bikes up and down Connecticut in an area that's mostly middle-aged and senior population, a lot of folks with kids who have to drive their kids to school and the like. So it strikes me that what we're signing up for is dumping a lot of traffic uh, onto roads with schools and kids uh, in exchange for helping out a few number of cyclists. Um, so I'm curious about how you're thinking about about those. And then longer term, if, if we're seeing that there's not a lot of cyclists, how open is DDOT gonna be to reversing the changes that they've made? Um, David, let me just try to answer one or two of your questions. Um, um, you talked about meaningful engagement. Uh, I think uh, we completed as of now, it'll be approximately 50 events, 50 meetings uh, with both uh, the community, uh, the community, the residential community associations, the ANCs that represent you. Uh, we um, met with, I said, the institutional users. Uh, we've had meetings that really were open to everyone. Uh, and we've used many modalities to get people to those meetings. And I think we've been successful. Um, so I guess, um, you know, uh, it's my opinion, um, again, that, that we've gone you know, above and beyond so far in terms of uh, making sure the stakeholders uh, have meaningful input into the project. Um, that being said, we're, we're not done yet. Uh, we're seeking input um, over the summer into the fall and throughout the design process. So, you know, you have uh, an opportunity to work with us um, to continue to make this project the best project that we can make it. Um, uh, I, let me ask Will, you mentioned 15th Street. Will, can you talk about traffic uh, or bike volumes on 15th Street? I'm sure, yeah. Um, it's our highest volume bike corridor by far uh, of the on-street facility, right? Trails have have higher, but as our on-street facilities go, 15th is the highest. Uh, we've built that one in about five different increments, uh, starting in 2009 with a one-way protected bike lane, which um, saw a lot of two-way riding. So we changed it to a two-way facility the next year and have extended it um, all the way up from uh, Essentially, it's a protected bike lane from Euclid um, now all the way down to East Base and Drive um, uh, on the National Mall area and the, near the Jefferson Monument. Um, our most recent counts, uh, we're getting probably peak hour volumes, like four or five hundred cyclists an hour, uh, which is, uh, I would think, above what the car lanes are taking per hour. Um, we probably have. Yeah, more like 1200 across the 3 remaining car lanes. So, um. Your 500 bikes per hour is exceeding that and. Uh, when we do these facilities that have, um. Really excellent bike accommodations, we can actually increase the overall capacity of a road. Um, 1 of our citywide goals is to get people to shift modes. So drivers taking trips by bike, uh, possibly by scooter by e bike. And it actually is happening in the places that we've um, we've provided that top tier level of infrastructure to do so. Um, and I think our most recent count actually was, uh, yeah, we had we did a we did a count on the uh, new portion of 15th Street, the sort of across the mall, and it was in a cold weather month. But it was suggesting that we're we're probably getting um, maybe 1,500 a day, which is which is pretty strong volume of cyclists and scooter riders. Um, again, that's that was in a quarter that um, was even narrower than Connecticut Avenue, and we were able to reconfigure the road without any uh, diminution of um, vehicular capacity. But we were able to add this enormous bicycle capacity, and now it's being well used by by those uh, uh, by those users, and serving an important um, tourism function as well. In that case, uh, was there was a question about demographics, but really what we're we're planning for all ages and abilities networks. Um, 
when we have an arterial that's fairly high stress, we do need to provide that level of separation and protection that the, the barriers uh, provide. But ultimately, you know, we're, we're designing these facilities so that um, an eight-year-old with their parents can ride in these lanes or, or be, you know, pulled on a trail of bike or something like that. And then all the way up to, um, you know, we're seeing like, you know, people in their 80s riding e-bikes especially. Um, certainly people in their 70s still riding. So we're, we're, we're planning these facilities not for riders like, you know, the kind I, I am, which I'm pretty comfortable riding in any conditions on most of the roads that aren't freeways, but, but it's for people that do need the extra level of protection and accommodation. Mm -hmm. And that's really the only way we're growing the, um, the mode share of bicycling, the number of, you know, the percentage of people who are taking, taking bikes as opposed to some other mode of transportation. Uh, it does work. Um, we have a couple areas of town that are, you know, approaching that sort of integrated network level um, with protected facilities. And, you know, you can just go there and you can see uh, people of all walks of life riding for all types of trips. Um, and it, it really does work when you when you make the accommodations for those users. Thanks, Will. Well, what sort of volume are you expecting on Connecticut? Um, and what sort of volume would you say if in five years, right, like the project's played its way out, would ought to be considered a win for the community. Yeah, I think, you know, starting, we would probably have 300 an hour. Oh, yeah, Will, Will um, yeah. we actually did the yeah. modeling. We actually okay, did the yeah. modeling for the Carter. And um, long-term, we show about 3,000 bicycles per day. Yeah. And what do you consider a win? So that if you don't hit that number, or if there's downside on the traffic, you know, DDOT would say, you know what, we need to take a second look at this. I'd say keep in mind what one of the in the active transportation division, what they're doing. And we'll can elaborate this a little bit more, but, but we're making connections little by little, right? 1 mile by 1 mile, 1 block by 1 block. So, um, you know, at, at some point, we will have a fully connected city of protected bicycle lanes and that will encourage more and more folks to, uh, to, to use the bicycle as a, a significant mode of transportation. So you, the city doesn't have any goals for the number of cyclists we, that we, you consider to be. We said it before. But it's fifteen percent of all trips that are we want to be bike trips. So it's a large goal, um, citywide. And what does that number boil down to on Connecticut? I think you know what Ed said is correct. Like if if we're hitting um, three thousand a day, that's that's what we expect. Uh, even. You know, fraction of that would be a very strong success compared to, you know, what, what we have today. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's there's a wide range. This is like a Goldilocks question. It's like, you know, too hot, too cold. We had we've had projects where people say, "Oh, that's far too many cyclists. We don't want that. Oh, it's far too few project cyclists. We, you don't want to do the project. It's not going to accommodate everybody." It's really, we will. you know, there's a large range of cyclists that we expect when we do projects like this, and it's been proven on all of our other projects that it does in fact happen. I don't think it's um, it's conjecture at all to expect that. How are you thinking about the traffic about Reno? Because the Goldilocks problem exists on the traffic as well. You're dumping a lot of cars onto secondary roads, two lane roads. And what I'm trying to understand is what's the win that we're going to, I'm going to end up with my kids sitting in traffic to sacrifice for. And so I get it 15%. That's a noble goal. Great. If we can do that, that's awesome. But how are we thinking about what you're going to be doing on Reno in connection with school guards, crossing guards and the like right now it's very thin. How are you going to manage the traffic lights to ensure that traffic isn't backed up for miles where people can't get into work? Sir, let me just uh, conclude by saying um, that um, our safe routes to school uh, division, we're working with Eaton, we're working with, uh, we'll be working with Merch and others. Um, uh, there's a plan for Eaton Elementary School now. So, you know, we'll be working with each of the schools uh, uh, as we progress with this project, but and separately as well, because our safe routes to school program. Um, that's what they do. They look at each of the schools along along the corridor. And does that include the private schools as well? Um, I'll have to get back to you on the private schools. I mean, one would think after doing this long yeah. of a study, you'd yeah. really answer yeah. that. There's a lot of private schools there, and a lot of kids. They're all DC residents, or many of them yeah. are, and we owe yeah. those kids the safety too. Yeah, I will get back to you on that question, sir. Thank you, David. Thanks, Ed. And we do have a few more questions too in the Q and A. So I want to make sure I turn it back over to Ian so we can get a few more questions in before we do our closing remarks. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, thanks, Ed and Will. Um, this question goes back to Adam. Uh, 
and did I hear you right when you stated uh, going to compensate for the confiscation of parking on Connecticut Avenue and that you consider switching side street residential parking into commercial parking? And this goes back to your portion of the presentation. Uh, oh, sure. Um, we will look at side streets, definitely. Um, uh, and we're not making any decisions, but we're going to take the community with us. And uh, there's certain uh, parking spaces along, uh, let's say, Calvert Street, for example, that, that um, you know, it might be three hours. Uh, we might want to make that, uh, you know, 30 minutes or one hour. So, again, um, all um, our, our thoughts are open uh, and that there's no decisions, but we'd like to go out with the community. And look at some of those side streets to see if there are opportunities uh, to increase uh, parking turnover. And this is like uh, part two. Jeff uh, had a follow up that almost dovetails into what you were just talking about. To ensure that there is available street parking for when I drive, will you be considering verbal curb pricing to ensure frequent turnover? Will you? That's part A. Part B is will you commit to ensuring parking revenues goes to T. DM efforts along the corridor to lessen demand for a curb space. Uh, let me see if David Lipscomb from our parking and uh, transport ground transportation division is on. He is on. Yes, I am. And I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question, please? I was trying to find it in the chat. But no problem. It. It's at 927 from Jeff Hill. The question again is um, to ensure there is available street parking for when I need to drive. Will you consider variable? curb pricing to ensure frequent turnover. That's part A. Second part is will you commit to ensuring parking revenues goes to TDM efforts along the corridor to lessen demand for curb space? And I think the first part of the question was about, <clears throat> excuse me, variable pricing. Um, I'd have Correct. to do some, do some research. Um, we had done pilot, we have done a pilot like that previously um, in Chinatown um, that predated my tenure at DDOT. Um, so I'd have to do some research to see whether that's uh, an option that can be used currently um, or for this project. Uh, regarding the second question with TDM, I believe me, uh, I think the question was about meter revenue. Um, I believe meter revenue is committed um, by um, regulation um, to um, um, uh, go toward uh, the district's contribution toward Metro. Um, so in terms of any change of where that money would be going, that would require, uh, I believe, legislation from council. Thanks, David, appreciate it. And the next question is, um, in the extension to Chevy Chase Circle, will you study traffic coming from this, from Connecticut Avenue to South Maryland side also is optimizing traffic signals along Connecticut Avenue a part of any of the traffic calming study? I, I would say, uh, yeah, um, we'll be looking at all of the traffic signals along Connecticut Avenue um, and in any of the final design will apply um, um, different operations. Uh, so yeah, um, definitely look at all of the signals as we complete the, the new design. Um, the first question was with regard to uh, Chevy Chase Circle, the extension, the potential extension of the bike lane to Chevy Chase Circle, and what was the um, the question? We will be looking at at traffic, uh, not in the circle, but but basically within uh, from Legation Street to just south of, of the circle. Thanks, Ed. Uh, question for Max: Is there any way to get this in place sooner than 2025? I think you saw in our um, a graphic uh, on, on the project timeline, uh, we have two procurement elements of the project. One is design and the other is the construction procurement. And um, um, I would say procurements in, in the district are pretty complex uh, and, and they generally take between seven and nine months or so. Uh, so if, you know, it's almost 2 years of, of procurement time, um, if you think about it, so, um, that's, you know, part of the issue that, that we have to deal with. Thanks Ed. last question. And then I'm going to uh, turn it back over. Not the last question, but I'm going to turn it back over to Charlotte for one other person on the, on the, who has their hands up. Um, question is. 
what do you uh what will you do to make sure motorists obey the traffic signals and speed limits will there be automated enforcement as part of this project uh i think i said earlier that that we would like to see automated enforcement as part of the project uh i think another uh participant said will we have it at every location and the answer is no but we certainly are going to look once the uh uh, speed limits are set from 30 to 25 miles per hour and give it 6 months or give it a year. Um, we'll start looking at potential locations for either speed enforcement or red light uh, camera enforcement and we'll be working with our automated enforcement um, office uh, on that. Thanks, Ed. Charlotte. Yes, thank you. Um, we have Eileen who has her hand raised. Um, can we unmute Eileen, please? Go ahead, Eileen, you're unmuted. <clears throat> okay. Um, I, I actually raised my hand, but I'll go ahead and say what I, what I put in, in Q and a, I, I'm the former pedestrian council member who was on the CAC. Um, at the time I was the, I was actively on the council. <clears throat> and I just want to point out, um, Ed, I think, you know, I made extensive comments on the inadequacy of pedestrian signal timing along Connecticut. Um, the federal guidance, in my view, is is, is not good. Um, it relies on uh, research that doesn't support the conclusions the Fed's reached, but <clears throat> I don't want to belabor that. I just want to um, support Amy's comment um, about asking DDOT to make sure that the signal timing is um, improved um, as opposed to just being left where it is um, as you can continue with the project. Thanks. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you, um, Eileen and Ed. Um, we are at 1047, and I know we have some closing items that we also need to, to get to. Um, so I wanted to make sure that people know that we have recorded all of your questions, and we will get back to you regarding your questions as well, the ones that we were not able to get to in the chat um, in the Q&A function. And as Ed um, goes through the next part of the presentation, we will also talk about how we need to make sure we get some of your official comments as well. And so we will be going through some closing remarks and assure you that we'll reach back up and follow back up with those. And I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Uh, um, Charlotte, can you see my screen or should I be sharing again? Can you share your screen again, Ed? Yeah, let's try that. Thank you. Right. Let me know if you can see that. Yes. Thank you, Ed. All right. Great. All right, we've, uh, we're now going to go into the closing portion of the meeting. Uh, Charlotte, would you like to uh, talk a little bit about our Title VI requirements? Sure, absolutely. Um, just to remind you all that the Title VI form is the form that we use to collect your comments, um, and we really encourage you to use this form so that we can document your comments as well. Um, you see a QR code that is at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you could take a picture of that, you will get the Title VI form. Um, please note again, as Ed mentioned, we do have two meetings that you see on the left-hand side of this sample of the Title VI form. Um, we have today's meeting that you would click if you're providing comments regarding your interaction with us today. Um, and we also have a button that you would click um, or you would mark if you come out tomorrow to our 6 o'clock p.m. in-person meeting. Okay, so we ask that you mark um, and make sure you mark which meeting that you are providing comments for. The same material will be presented at both meetings, but we just want to document um, where your comments are coming from. Um, so thank you very much, and please make sure you get this form back to us. We will also be emailing it. Um, during this week out to all the participants that signed on to the virtual um, webinar here as well. And it has also been placed um, the link into the chat as well for you um, to pull it from the chat. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, again, uh, just to let you know that we are having an in-person meeting tomorrow, June 29th at 6 p.m. UDC 4200 Connecticut Avenue at the Student Center in the third floor ballroom. The format will be a bit different than it is today. We will still have a brief introductory presentation uh, on the project status, but we'll have tables with uh, all the large maps. You'll be able to look at the um, 
uh, maps in, in much more detail. I know it's a little bit difficult, uh, you know, virtually. So those maps will be available to look at. We hope that you can put stickies uh, and put your comments uh, on the maps directly. That will help us tremendously. And um, again, uh, you'll be able to speak to all of the members of our project team tomorrow night. Again, uh, we encourage you to complete the Title VI work. Again, thank you for your attendance at today's uh, meeting, our virtual meeting. Appreciate all of your comments, uh, and we would hope that that you provide comments to DDOT by July 31st, uh, 2022, by the Title VI. Again, thank you again for your attendance. Um, again, we have a, a, our slides showing the project staff. You can contact any of us. And again, have a great day. Appreciate your attendance.